physical object on this earth has three agents of success. The creator, the propagator, and the user. The creator creates a product, the propagator sells it, and the user utilizes it. The success of that product, policy, idea, or technology depends on the performance of all three. We're all part of this chain, performing one role or the other in our lives, and most often, we limit our performance without realizing it. An experience taught me this, and it was quite an embarrassing moment, to be honest. I was desperately looking for a phone app that would lock my social media apps for me. I was sick and tired of all the scrolling I did in the day, and all I wanted was for an alarm to go off on my phone and say, that's it, your time's up. I must have spent months in this state of longing. When will I find that magical app that will save me so much time? I finally did the smart thing, and I called a tech-savvy friend. I said, hey, listen, I've been trying for days. I cannot find an app locker on the app store. He said, what do you mean, an app locker? I said, you know those ones that lock your social media apps for you after a certain amount of time? And he said, you know you have an inbuilt feature in your phone that performs the exact same function, don't you? My tech-savvy friend judged me very hard that day. Apparently, an iPhone user of five years is supposed to know something about that. But I was ignorant, and I still am, frankly, of the amazing things my device can do. In this particular example, the creator must have designed the product beautifully, and the propagator must have advertised it, but I, the user, didn't allow the potential of this feature to be truly realized. The potential of so many things in our lives are unrealized due to this very circumstance. I mean, we've all done it, most of the times inadvertently. I think the only place where we really squeeze out maximum potential is from our almost empty toothpaste in the morning. Imagine if we applied this to our daily lives. Our time, efforts and energy can be utilized to become more productive. I'm in my early 20s, you know, that age group, when we hate cleaning our room. And just like everyone else in this stage of their lives, I'm gripped with a fervor of doing something great. There's a sense of anxiety almost about the future and about the steps that need to be taken to get there. We all need to maximize on this energy to become more productive in our lives. There's a myth I'd like to debunk here. I get asked a lot about how I'm able to do so many things. And I hear a lot of, it's in your personality, or you have some special ability. And I think to myself every time that that's not true. I'm an ordinary girl, just like everyone else. Perhaps the only difference is that I'm aware that there is always more to something, more things you can do in a particular amount of time, more growth and more potential. The announcement of the lockdown all the way back in March came as a surprise, mainly because I didn't understand the seriousness of the issue back then. I remember thinking to myself that this would last only for a couple of weeks and I'd better use this time to catch up on my pending tasks. Those two weeks turned into months and months of staying at home, day in and day out. It was so hard to remain productive and to get stuff done. And as a medical student, I really wanted to take a long break. But my ability to recognize the potential that this extra time had allowed me to stay on track. I actually managed to get a couple of publications under my belt. I was very lucky to be guided by a doctor who's been bitten by the research bug like I've never seen before. One of the most inspirational people I've met, she guided my inexperienced mind and allowed me to put my core beliefs of maximizing potential into practice in the form of research. The study that we conducted in the following months proved to me that the tools we use today are not utilized to its maximum potential. The doctor sent me a message one day saying that her team wanted to conduct some research related to COVID-19 that I could be a part of, provided I came up with some good ideas. Now, this is back in April, before the scientific community was absolutely flooded with research papers, and I was excited. I then surfed the net, like we all do when we need some brain stimulation, and I came across a blog about the importance of smartphone apps in this pandemic on the National Institutes of Health website. Now, I knew of smartphone apps being of use in this pandemic, 
But when I did a simple search on the App Store with the keyword COVID, I expected maybe one or two apps. You'd be surprised at the number of apps I found. And when we did conduct the research systematically, we found 63 apps spread across three countries. So many apps performing similar functions. Not only is this confusing to the user, but it is also detrimental to contact tracing efforts. If everyone downloaded the app of their choosing, how could each work to their full potential? Mobile health apps is not a new technology. Actually, one of the first telephone-related health services was employed way back in 1949. But as phones became smarter and smarter, the mobile health or mHealth industry grew. There are over 3.5 billion smartphone users in the world today, which means almost every third person owns a smartphone. And over 2,000 smartphones are bought per second. Since health is a necessity for all, the mobile health apps are bound to grow. But whether they grow in functionality and efficiency, or just in number, is a question worth asking. And it's not just the number of health apps that is a challenge. Today we have millions of drugs, each with their own strengths, their own features, sometimes minor differences. But we have doctors to tell us what is the best for our condition based on scientific evidence rigorous studies. Feedback from this scientific evidence allows a drug to perform to its maximum potential. So why should health apps be any different? This is the exact question we had on our minds when we designed our study. We decided to use a standardized tool that has been used before to rate the quality of mobile health apps by assessing their engagement, their functionality, their aesthetics, and their credibility of information, and use this scale to rate the quality of as many COVID apps as we could find. I could have stuck to the Indian app databases. That would have meant less work and faster results. But I believe that my study had the potential to be more meaningful. I maximized on this opportunity to do something bigger and approach medical professionals in the UK and the USA. So our team grew from a couple of curious people to 10 members spread across three countries. The success that I achieved by the publication of this project strengthened my belief in the realization and actualization of the potential of opportunities in our lives. Of course, you have to know where to start. I was almost tempted to call a colleague's relative in Australia saying, hello, do you want to be a part of this? One of the most striking features of the results of the study was that most of the apps did not maximize on the potential that they have in this pandemic. Some had an extremely reliable source of information, but lacked creativity in presentation. And others were so beautiful to look at, so interactive, but the credibility of their information was doubtful. Imagine if there was someone who maliciously faked information about the COVID numbers or the deaths. Not only does he not know how to use his time well, but he's also putting other people in danger. Maybe he did it because he wanted to decrease the level of alertness people need to have for this pandemic. Or maybe he did it because he was sick of masks. Whatever the reason may be, this form of information is dangerous. A study published in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene showed that 800 people and possibly more had lost their lives due to misinformation surrounding this pandemic. Many more were hospitalized. Now imagine if people had the power to pull out their smartphones and open not a forwarded message, but the COVID-19 app and say, hold on a minute, you're wrong. Misinformation can be tackled so effectively, provided that health app is updated regularly, complies with quality standards. This technology has the power to save lives. Smartphone apps can be used to log in your symptoms every day. You can see the rate of rise in the COVID cases. You can even ask for advice regarding what to do next when someone thinks they have symptoms. But if this technology is not utilized to its maximum potential, how will it benefit anyone? The creators, instead of uploading more and more apps to flood the app markets, could receive feedback on the quality of their app and try to improve it. 
The propagators could set a standard under which no mHealth app can exist, thus decreasing the number of bad choices available. And finally, the user. They could benefit by making the standard app quality rating visible to them before they download. This will allow that the best technology is accessible to all. Now, I've spoken about maximizing the potential of the objects around us. But how about we look at this from a broader perspective? Apply this to our time, our efforts, our energy, even our relationships. There's so much good to be had from it all. If only we were aware of it. When I say maximize the potential, which I have said quite a few times already, I don't mean to say use every aspect of an object until it goes dry or use every moment of your time until you draw. What I mean is, use it well. Use your time well. Use your devices well. Use the smartphone app sitting in your phone that's supposed to protect you from COVID-19 well. Now, I'm not someone famous. I'm not someone who was born with special abilities. I don't wake up at 5 a.m. in the morning, drink a green smoothie, and pack an exercise routine all before the sun has even risen. Actually, I'm not even busy 24-7. But that doesn't mean I don't use my time well. You don't need to have special abilities in order to perform tasks and activities that are beneficial to yourself and ultimately others. It's really as simple as making a list of the things you need to do and by when you need to do them. If that list is long, look at each item one at a time. This will help you reduce your anxiety and prevent you from sweeping everything under the rug and binge watching a TV show instead. Mindless scrolling through social media apps really decreases the potential of our performance at work. So just keep your phones aside. Often, people underestimate the capacity to participate in multiple projects. That makes them say no to opportunities that might have benefited them with respect to their career, their experience, their learning. Two key things I always keep in mind are one, Planning is absolutely essential. And two, don't say no to an opportunity, no matter how taxing the task may seem. If you have space in your plate, don't let the fear of being overburdened deter you from accepting that task. Maximize on the potential of that opportunity and you are bound to get your returns. If you have the ability to pack an entire syllabus three days before an exam, then you have the potential to do anything. I have failed, I have cried, and I have given up too. But what keeps this ordinary girl going is the belief in maximizing potential.